seemed to be quite interesting uh, sort of end to the discussion on science and religion. I just basically wanted to clarify one point that in this discussion of science and religion, um, I know we wanted to point out that sort of religion is superior and science is sort of uh, not necessary. Science is a source of all evil. Uh, on the contrary, basically what I wanted to portray is that you know all the scientific developments are good. We're all reaping the benefits of, uh, of, of all the scientific developments. It is it's very essential. But the main point was that science will plateau or it will reach to a certain point and then religion is something even more beyond. So no matter how much progress one can make from a scientific point of view, there will still be some vacuum or some hollowness and that will be replaced by religion. So religion fulfills that kind of vacuum or space. So, so that, that was kind of the first uh, point I wanted to uh, come across. The other point was obviously they are complementary with one another. So what science discovers everything, obviously religion does not talk about it in so much more detail. They are kind of complementary to one, one another. So from where we left uh, last time, I think we left it here. Uh, at, at, at here. So, um, so I think today the scope of what I was going to, what I wanted to discuss is let's just look at science in itself and religion in itself, and that is the scope. Last time we looked at some of the comparison. What are the pros and cons of science and religion? Now, if you look at the history, uh, I mean, we t touched on it briefly that the Earth and the Sun. Does the sun revolve around the earth or does the earth revolve around the sun? So there was kind of a, a lot of controversy in, in, in the past. And if you look at the, the Christian faith, a lot of people were persecuted for saying something which is against the biblical revelations. And obviously what transpired is something which is exactly opposite to what the Bible was uh, 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 suggesting. So I think from that point of view, what's actually admirable for science, science upholds the truth from a certain point of view. I see, I observe, and if, if this is what it is, then it doesn't matter who proclaims whatever they've said, but I now need to uh, adhere to this, uh, this thing which I've observed. Religion can become dogmatic. People say, no, it's been said for so long, and I need to just follow it. So you, in a way, then become sort of tunnel vision. No, you don't share it now. One of the reasons why, for example, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, they did not admit women into their colleges. And one of the reasons is that, uh, for example, even uh, Oxford, they did not have an MBA course until just uh, early 2000. And one of the reasons is Oxford has existed without an MBA course for almost 2000 years. What's the point of having an MBA course now? So they just, Oxford did not want to create an MBA course. Oxford is very good at economics, it, it, it's very good for this, but Oxford did not have an MBA course until recently when they started the side business school. But the common ground was that, look, we've existed for so long and, and there's no need, no need to innovate, no need to create new courses. So, so that dogmatic, that very fixated mind can then can become a problem both sort of in the mundane world and in the spiritual world. Now let's look at it, uh, science and religion. Where we started is that the quest is who am I, where am I being, where did I come from, what is, who created the universe. So if you look at the history, the Greek philosophers, they were people who then started suggesting that water is the source of life. Now, you can actually blame them from having such a view. In a, in a way, if you actually observe, it is in a way quite true. The human body is 70% water. If you look at the earth, 70% of the earth is actually water, if you look at the entire earth. So, if you look at plants, animals, the main constituent is water. So, water is a basic element that's a source of life. So, there was one view that life only starts with water. If, if you look at what all the extra uh, people are doing all these explorations in the other worlds, space exploration, the key factor is can we find water in any of these distant lands, Mars or anywhere. If I find water, then that's a sure sign that there is life uh, in, in the, uh, the other worlds. So water has become the key element, that it is the source of life. Then, then people started becoming that water is becoming the only source of life, so that is the only matter which is important. Then someone else came along and said, no, water is important, but air is actually even more important because you can actually have air, uh, water, but respiration or breathing is, become, is, is the hallmark of life. Without air, there essentially is no life. So people were then going into all these uh, various thoughts. Then in the other element, fire. And you'll think that, is fire a source of life? Yes. They'll say that in our human body, we have digestion. Digestion is a kind of a power. If you look at our, if someone touches you, 
that you know, the body is warm. One of the signs of life is that if I'm a dead body, the body will become very cold. So there is heat within the body. That without sunlight, life will not exist. So without heat, plants will not be able to do photosynthesis. So there was that school of thought saying that it, heat is the only source of life. Source of life creates, is emanated from just heat. And finally, there were the other kind of school of thought. People say that life starts from earth. Like, and that kind of concept is also very prevalent among the Hindu. And once when I sort of die, all my constituents will merge in, in, into the elements. So the water in my body will merge into the water of the universe. The, the heat within me will sort of blend in with the heat of the universe. And, and that same concept then extended along saying Brahma. Brahma is a supreme god and once when I die, he is the only soul, Brahma. And once, what is the purpose of life? For me to merge into Brahma. So I don't have a separate distinct entity, I'm not a separate soul. The purpose of life is to merge into Brahma. And that was a concept. So that and that was through observation. So if I die, so the air will merge with the air in, in the of the universe. So it's that kind of concept of merging. So so people then started saying that there's no separate entity as soul. So the creation of life started with the concept of matter, that these are the core elements, four elements, and that's how. Uh, uh, this is the purpose of life. That's how we all got created, and, and, and that's that's how people started thinking about who am I, who created me, and and, and, and so that's where it started from. If you look at the periodic table, which is matter, it's been evolving. When you were at school, they probably had about 100 uh, elements. Now the scientists have come up to about 118 elements. So the periodic table is now today, and as time goes on, they'll come up, discover new elements, and that periodic table will keep on extending. So the point is, science evolves, and as we come towards the end of the presentation, what I'm uh, wanting to convey, what is what I'm thoroughly convinced is that what has been revealed by the scriptures is kind of the bigger picture. It's like the quest of life is, is, is has been answered as to what's out there, and, and, and so therefore the scriptural knowledge is in a way encompassing. I'm not talking about the rituals; I'm talking about the core main principles uh, which have been revealed in, in the scriptures. Now, if you look at Earth being the origin of life, I think it's quite interesting to, to read this. When the Roman, in fact, uh, this is from the uh, Colosseum in, in, in Rome. When the Romans, Romans used the word homo, man, they probably no longer remembered that in doing so, that they were describing human beings that is terrestrial. The noun of homo, like the adjective humans, human is etymologically linked to humus, the earth. This valuable linguistic clue leads us to the numerous myths widespread in the Near East in which earth is the matter from which the first human being is made. So now it's a conclusive, the Romans believed so strongly that humans were created out of earth. The potter's will, both Adam in Genesis and Enkidu in the Meso Mesopotamian epic are born of earth, as is Pandora, the deceptive image. A woman made by Hermes on the order of Zeus to bring ruin to mortals. In Egypt, the god Hunan is depicted as a potter making human beings on his will. So you actually find graphics in Egypt whereby they are saying that humans are actually created out of the earth. And in Athens, by contrast, human beings are not born of earth but from earth. So essentially we are earth. We are not born of earth, we actually are earth. So these concepts of, of, of earth being a, a source of life was such an endemic in, in, in the Roman Empire. Now let's look at what some scientists say, uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, science. Uh, the first one is by John Jing. He says everything that has been... Sorry, what are the scriptures say? This is what the Romans and uh, Egyptians have the thing. What are the scriptures say? I'm coming to that. So that's, that's I'm just pointing the scientific point across and then I'll, I'll come across what the, 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 Jain, the Jain point across. That we, we, this is what, how it's evolved. And even in the scientific community, things have evolved. So as I go along my, my presentation, we'll come up what, what did Aristotle think, what did sort of Pluto think, and how the concept has changed. Even in the scientific community, their ideologies have changed. And then eventually, where are we right now, and what does sort of change, change view believe in? So some scientists on science, everything that has been said, every conclusion that has been tentatively put forward, is quite frankly speculative and uncertain. So science right now has not come up with any conclusive, the kind of the universal law. We have tried to discuss whether present day science has anything to, to say on certain difficult questions which are perhaps set for ever beyond the reach of human understanding. 
I think the last line is very uh, uh, apt. Perhaps it ought to be rather uh, to say that science should leave off making pronouncements. Science cannot come and say, what I have now said is the ultimate truth. This is it. Science cannot give the message because science is going to be progressing, science is going to evolve and there can be no scientist who can come and say that what I am saying is gospel truth and the final truth. It's some, someone else is going to come along and then disprove his theory and some, some other mindset will, will be prevalent. The river of knowledge has too often turned back on itself. Look at Einstein himself. We can only know the relative truth. The absolute truth is known to the universal observer. So someone uh, as, as, as uh, Einstein himself says, whatever we, we know is not the absolute truth. It's a relative truth. Truth, truth. And, and there's a very po uh, popular concept within the uh, Jain uh, text which says, Dravya Shetra Kal Nepal. In this time, in this day and age, at this present moment, this is what I know. Maybe if the time changes, if the place, location changes, the, the, the truth might be something else. Um, this, the, the, the point uh, is about the Gitanjali which was written by Tagore. The point which I wanted to emphasize here is that quite often what you see right now, in, especially in the Eastern world like in India and in many of the countries in the East, is the blind following of the Western standards. And this is, I'm not talking about science, again I have a little bit of comparison here, is that attitude of following what the West has been doing. If you look at how sort of India has been developing moral concepts, the concept of dressing. So, all the materialism which the West has enjoyed, the benefits of fruits of all the luxuries, everything, its countries in the East are actually following them blindly. And and where does Tagore come in? Tagore had written this beautiful book which was known as Gitanjali. For many years the book was unnoticed and, and then some, uh, at one point in time the British actually said that ah, what a beautiful piece of text and um, he should actually got a Nobel laureate for this literature. Uh, he should get it. So uh, Tagore was actually having a bath he came out of the bath and some fellow friends came along. The congratulations, we are very happy for you. He says, well, what for? What's, what's happened? He says, haven't you heard the news that uh, you've now got the Nobel laureate? And, and Tagore was actually very upset. He says, really? Oh, I'm, I'm not at all happy. And people are perplexed that how can you not be happy when you've now got a Nobel laureate and then the whole world has recognized your work. He says, you know what? He says, you guys are congratulating me here right now because you've not used your brains. It's the British who have used their brains they have now appreciated my piece of work and you for all these many years either read it or just put it in the shelves here and never have never appreciated this piece of work. This piece of work I've written for the Indian people. I wanted to convey my thoughts to you people and you are the ones who have just really not paid any heed to this. And he was actually quite sad at this fact here. So the point is that we used, we need to use our mind and not sort of have this blind following, blind, blind faith. Now what do some scientists say on soul? This is really where science and religion have to sort of come, uh, come together. Einstein says, I believe that intelligence is manifested throughout all nature. What a strong point. Look at what the Jains say. Okay? It's not only the intelligence, it's not only the domain of humans. We have got a soul, animals have got a soul, plants have got a soul. That soul will keep on evolving. So intelligence is not the domain of just humans only. When, 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 when there is a sunlight and it, we have all done the experiments in science, the plant will actually bend towards where there is sunlight for photosynthesis. It's instincts, but it's a form of intelligence. So again, Einstein is saying that intelligence is manifested throughout all nature, not the domain of humans. Because if you look at the biblical, there was always a tendency of that God created sort of humans, and then humans were in charge of all the hierarchy, the animals and the plants and everything. And that's kind of, so there's no hierarchy here. Sir Eddington, something unknown is doing. We don't know what. I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard, I regard matter as a derivative from consciousness. What a bold statement. He's actually saying that consciousness is actually more superior and matter is actually evolving out of consciousness. It's a derivative. You, you actually derive. You're deriving chas from, so, uh, from milk and whatever. So chas is a derivative. It's actually made out of the milk and ramati. But again, that's where James would differ. We, we know that G and matter are two separate distinct entities. One is not a derivative of one another. But here is someone who believes that, that, that there's something more than matter. So James James, there is a wide measure of agreement that stream of knowledge is heading towards a non-mechanical reality. It's nothing mechanical, not matter. Universe begins to look more like a thought than like a great machine. Mind no longer appears to be an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. 
So people are scientists now developing that we are extending the, our knowledge of the human mind, human body. We, we are making huge leaps and bounds in, in, in terms of discoveries, but there's something more beyond that. Sir Thompson, the great design, he, he wrote a book which is known as a great design. Throughout the world of animal life, there are expressions of something akin to the mind in ourselves. There is from amoeba upwards a stream of inner and subjective life, right from the single sense cell animals. It may only be a slender reel here, reel is like a small stream, but somewhere it is a strong current. Such parallels with Jainism, we believe that they soul, but again we believe that they are so different senses, one sense beings, two sense beings, three sense beings. So if it's a one sense being, it's only a got touch, it has got no other senses. So it's kind of a, the consciousness is very minimal, just a touch consciousness. And then you evolve into two sense, three sense, four and five sense beings. Exactly what Sir Thompson is saying. That it may be a, a, only a slender reel, like a small stream, but somewhere it's like a strong current. The consciousness is very, very prevalent. All the five senses are, are subjugated. It includes feeling, imagining, purposing. And so and that's what he's saying. That basically, it's just not just uh, uh, what we see ourselves. It's something to do with thoughts, feeling, imagining, purposing. And these are all the attributes of soul, consciousness. Oh, it even includes the unconscious. unconscious. This again is very prevalent here because what we know is that my makeup is not only what I am here right now, some scars, some of the karmic pattern has been carried forward from my previous births. So that, that unconsciousness is there. I've got a fear of something. Where does that fear come from? It's come, probably come from my the, 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 the past births. So this some scars, which, which is a very common term, is, is again something which is unconscious. Aldein, the truth is that not matter, not any physical thing, but mind or personality is the central fact of the universe. So now they're moving away from body or matter and they say that there's something more beyond that. And Arthur Compton, a conclusion that suggests the possibility of consciousness after death, even as the flame is distinct from the log of wood, which serves it temporarily as fuel. But when, it, when it's winter and we, when you're burning wood, we know that when the sort of the, the wood has now burnt out, you now put a new, sort of new fresh wood in and again the, the fire. So the flame is constant and that's exactly what you say. This body is going to go away, but the soul, the Atma is going to last on, carry on. So again, the same kind of concept which Arthur Compton is saying, that the flame is distinct from the wood itself. Oliver Lodge. Time will assuredly come when the avenues into unknown regions will be explored by science. The universe is a more spiritual entity than we thought. The real fact is that we are in a mix of a spiritual world which dominates the material. Amazing statement that he is now putting so much more emphasis on the spiritual world. And that is actually quite true because we are surrounded by matter. But what makes it interesting is the sort of the human and the spirit, the consciousness, the soul. And that's what it is. If it was just pure matter, you know, there will be no life. The real fact is, yeah, the soul of man passes between death and rebirth, reincarnation, as he passes through dreams in the night between day and day, uh, day, day and day. Between one day and the next day, there is a night, and through that you have dreams, and just as you pass through one day to the other day and having dreams, just in the same manner, you are going to be passing through one life to the other life. Again, sort of a very strong uh, sort of uh, correlation of between, between reincarnation. So this points to the fact that there are a lot of scientists who believe that there is more than just pure matter. Now, now let's come to a little bit where Jains come in. In the Acharan Sutra, it's, which is the first Adam of the Jains, the first chapter itself talks about plants and I mean Without being biased, I think there is no other text, I mean this is an independent scholarly study, it's not me saying that there is no other independent text from any other faiths which has portrayed that plants have got life and, and plants have got a soul. And what does the chapter, uh, first chapter in the Acharan Sutra say? That just as we are humans, plants are subject to the same kind of feelings that which we have. We are subject to birth, plants are subject to birth. We are subject to growth, plants are growing. We are down with consciousness, plants have got with consciousness. We wither, you can see the plant, the, the rose being withering. In our old age, you can see wrinkles on my face. I'll be withering. I need nutrition, plants need nutrition. Impermanent, we are impermanent, plants are impermanent. Non-internal, subject to metabolism and subject to change. All these factors are just as applicable to us as humans are applicable to the plant world. So plants have got life, plants have got a soul, plant, plants have got consciousness. They cannot express it, 
but they're going to and uh, I mean, without going into the details, what Jains have put up, uh, portrayed that plants have got, have got there are two types of plants: Pratyek Vanaspatikai and Southern Vanaspatikai. One body, one soul, like us, or one body and many souls. So, in this just one body of mind, you could be having many souls. That idea cannot be far fetched because, for example, when a mother is giving birth, in that same body there could be two separate souls. So, so, so one of the reasons why people, I mean this is again a very, I don't want to get into the topics, but one of the reasons being said that why do people not eat potatoes or onions, one of the reasons could be that one body has got many souls. So they say the eyes of the potatoes, so you, you have, so those could be kind of uh, an indication of souls. So one body but many souls and the whole point of Jainism is to minimize the violence, so that could be one area of the thought that, uh, that you know, that's one of the reasons why Jains would say that we are not eating underground roots. There could be other reasons for health benefits, there could be other reasons that you're destroying the entire plant when you when you take underground roots, but that's not the domain of today's topic. Uh, but again, as I said, so Pratik Manaspatikai, one body, one soul, and Sadhana Manaspatikai, one body, and there are many, many souls in there, just one body. Can you imagine vegetation? Can you imagine that suppose someone had the sanskars of non veg eating meat? Have you seen insect eating plants? Yeah. That's just amazing to, to know that there is a plant. Immobile plants cannot move by themselves, but how does it derive its nutrition by eating insects? So non-vegetarian vegetation. So here you have that. Look at the instincts, the karmas, or whatever you, you want to call it, the nature. But now you have a non-vegetarian plant. So not only you have non-vegetarians among humans, but also against 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 plants itself. I think this slide, I mean, answers your question about. Um, when I read the Jain literature, this slide essentially gave me the utmost satisfaction. This slide to me conveys all what religion has to convey to you. That quest of what is in this universe? Who am I? Where am I? And in this universe, I don't mean the earth. This, if you have the sort of faith in, in, in what has been portrayed in the scriptures here, this conveys to you that in the entire universe, you can talk about all the other worlds. You can go to Mars, Saturn, where you want to go to. You can talk of you want to go to Devlok, you want to go to hell. No matter where you want to go, reality, according to the Jains, is in this six astikai. And I'm going to spend about five, ten minutes. I mean, this is a it's a huge domain. You can actually have a whole term or even a whole year discussing this this topic here. But this, in in a in a nutshell, is a postulation of what Jains say constitutes reality. Not reality on earth. It's one of those the, the universal uh, facts, universal uh, truths. Now, what Jain say? What constitutes the entire universe? Entire universe: Earth, Moon, stars, Saturn. Everything is two substances, and those two substances are. I mean, this one is a little bit more. Uh, they are essentially the same diagram. I found this much more easier to convince, uh, to, to explain in the class. But it says there's one is consciousness, and the other thing is something which is unconscious. So those are the only two things which will, which will go. So if someone says that hey, I actually went to a distant world and I found some aliens. Fair enough. It might have a pointed triangular nose. It can have a different kind of body. But if it's if it's alive, it will have consciousness. It will have a soul, and it will have a different kind of body, green color or whatever it is. So, no matter where you go, that curiosity has now been satisfied. That this is what's in the entire universe: consciousness and something which is unconscious. So, consciousness is jivastikaya, and we'll also explain. I'll briefly explain why does it call it astikaya. What is this thing? That the six fundamentals is in text are called as cha asti kai. Asti means existence. It's a reality, it's not a figment of imagination. Very important. If I talk about oh, karma, if I talk about uh, devlo, there are certain things which are reality. You have to believe in it and it's asti, it's existence. If I told you, oh, there was a plant growing in the air, you'll say, look, that's an imagination. How can a plant grow in the air? It needs roots, roots have to go into the ground. You cannot actually have a plant growing in the air. That's a figment of imagination. A plant can fly, there's a hurricane, it can actually fly, but you cannot have a plant growing in the air. So if I use my logic, that, that means that that's, that's not reality. That's an imagination. I dreamt that a plant was growing in the air. So that's imagination. Asti kai, asti means existence and kai means body in a way, but means extension. That's what kaya means. So what does kaya mean? Extension means length, breadth and width. Anything which has got a kaya has got this question of extension. You, you, you extend. Jeev asti kaya. My soul can extend. If I'm an ant, my soul will go into an ant. If I become an elephant, that soul will expand. 
in, into, in, in, into the uh, body of an elephant. So the soul has a capacity of expanding and con contracting. So it's asti kaya, it's, 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 it exists asti and kaya. Kaya means it's got the propensity or the properties of extending. So jeep asti kaya, consciousness. The other part is the unconscious part. Now how, what, what is unconscious? A big part of the unconscious is matter, putgal. Putgal means pulen and galan, fusion and fission, matter. All matter comes under the realm of, 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 of Puttgalistic eye. So what science is discovering, everything that science is discovering, essentially all comes under this concept of matter. Chemistry, physics, biology again has got a, a dual because there's consciousness and, and there's kind of the human body. So it's kind of the, the in-between area. So all, all the domain of science will be under the Puttgalistic eye. Again, matter. Matter has got the property to extend. Look at this table. It can it, it can expand, uh, expand. So you can have a length, breadth, and, and, and height. So it's, it's a Puttgalistikaya. The Dharmastikaya and Adharmastikaya. Very interesting concepts. I'll touch them on briefly. Dharma does not end religion here. Dharmastikaya, the definition of Dharmastikaya is auxiliary cause of motion. Let's understand what does that mean. Auxiliary cause of motion means that you got water and you got fish, or you got a shark here. Does the water make the shark move? No. The shark sees a prey there, and because of the medium of water, the shark can move and it can go to its prey. So the water has become a medium for motion. If there is no water, the shark will not be able to move. So, but the, 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 the water will not make the shark move. If the shark wants to be in this place, it will be in this place. The choice is the sharks. The water does not make, does not make the shark move. So, Dharmastikaya is an auxiliary cause of motion. So that's because, and, and that's something which is unconscious, it's not matter. So if I have a, a Dharmastikaya, Dharmastikaya is not particles of matter. It is something, an unconscious entity. And where is uh, Dharmastikaya? In the entire universe. Entire universe. It is what James believed is the kind of triangular shaped universe. This Dharmastikaya is in the entire universe. In hell, heaven, in the middle world, wherever there is, there is, and therefore there is a concept of Jains which they say it's low and alone. So imagine if this is the universe, according to the Jains, this whole pedestal, everything else is alone. So there's no other mastic eye. That means the Jains believe that all life exists in Lok, and something which is alone is pure vacuum. Nothing exists there. No consciousness, no matter. Other mastic is the exact opposite property. It is, it's not matter. It's an unconscious entity, it does not have life, it does not have consciousness, and its property is, is rest. It, it enables something, if I want to rest, then I want to, uh, you, 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 you can rest. Otherwise, there will be perpetual motion. If I started moving, if there was just this Dharmastikaya, I'll keep on moving, moving and moving, I'll not be able to stop. So, Dharmastikaya is that auxiliary cause of rest. It's a very scorching heat, you are thirsty, and you want to take a rest. If you see a shade of a tree, you will you 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 will you will, not, you will want to take a pause. That shade of the tree is not making you to stop. It's your choice. I want to stop. I don't want to move any forward. I want to rest. So it's an auxiliary cause of rest. And again, it's an astikaya because, as we know, it is these two uh, entities are, are extending the entire universe: length, breadth, uh, breadth and height. Akas astikaya, space. Space is everywhere. What's the definition of space according to the James? That which accommodates itself and others. Simple definition of Akash. What is space according to the James definition? That which accommodates itself and others. Because otherwise you can come into a, what they call ad infinitum. Uh, oh, Akash. How is Akash there? Where is space? What, what, what upholds space? Is, is there any other entity which actually, because it, because it's there, space is there. So no, space accommodates itself and others. That's that's what Akash is. Now, Kal is a very, very interesting uh, topic. It comes under the, the six Astikaya, but it's not an Astikaya. A lot of James have debated on these points. There are a lot of Acharyas, one, one on this side of the camp and one on the other side of the camp. Time is a reality. And what is the definition of time according to uh, James? Vartan, that which is the essence of change. So that's what, what the definition of change is. The time, causes change, past, present and future. Now why is Kal not an Astikaya? So as you can see, everybody, everybody is written Puttalistikaya, Dharmastikaya, Dharmastikaya, Akashistikaya. Kal, time, time is not an Astikaya because time does not have extension. You cannot say time is this tall, time is this short. 
time does not have that extension in space. Time has got time does not have a, what James had called time does not have vertical extension. Time has got a horizontal extension. Past, present, and future. But you cannot say time is five centimeters tall, five, five, five this height. So all the others you could actually have dimension, but with time you cannot have dimension. Time has got a horizontal extension. All the others have got a vertical extension. So it's a it's a Gaia, but this is. Uh, uh, vertical and it's called uh, horizontal extension. So this, if one believes in this, this is in the entire universe. This is what, what essentially what James believed in. No creator, very important. Who created Dharmastikaya? Who created a Dharmastikaya? It's nature. There's been no creator God. There's no creator. Who created my soul? No creator. There's no. Who created matter? There's no creator. Very very. The distinct concept between change and in fact, that's probably the, the single. Uh, if one just asks in a one word, which one would you say is the main difference between Jains and Hindus? So many times we used to say that we, are, we, we all believe in sim. Hindus are very similar to Hindus, but Jains are very similar to Hindus. We believe in the concept of karma. We believe in the concept of reincarnation, both of us. But what's the single factor which distinguishes the two is the concept of creator. We do not Jains do not believe in that a, a creator entity. Acharan Sutra again. Acharya Siddhas and Divakar has enumerated six eternal truths dealt in the Acharan Sutra. So this is now saying, brothers and sisters, if you want to have the leap of faith or if you want to use your rational mind, these are the six things, please have kind of faith in it. Use your rational mind and start having faith. Soul exists. Atma Chit, it is eternal. Karta, it is the uh, doer. Bhokta, it is a reaper. There is Nirvana, there is liberation, there is emancipation out of this. And there's a path to attain emancipation. So this is a, from a very spiritual point of view. It's saying that this is this is where it is. It's now giving you some hope in life. That when people say, I'm now sick and tired of all this sansar, how, how can I get out of this? Now let's look at Aristotle. Aristotle was a disciple. Now there must have been many eminent scientists and people in the past, but from recorded history, we now know of someone like Aristotle. So Prior to Aristotle, there were the people who used to believe in the elements, the water, the fire, the air. And now comes someone like Aristotle and say, my creation has to do more with just these four elements. He was a disciple of Plato, around 400 years before the birth of Christ. And in a way, it's quite similar, or again, around the time of Lord Mahavir. Lord Mahavir was about 599 BC, so 600 years before Christ. So, uh, um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's sort of very contemporary of the time when Lord Mahavir was around. What I want to discuss here is that uh, Aristotle came up with a very unique concept of matter and form, and which is quite a, very similar to the Jain concept of substance and modes. What Jain says that all these, all these six things which I descri described earlier, they are substances. G is a substance. Matter is a substance. Separate, distinct entities. Dharmastikaya, dharma is a, is a substance. Substance is always eternal, there can be modes within it, changes within it. So I think I've, I've discussed that quite a, quite a lot in the past. Like you can have gold, then out of the gold you can have a golden ring, you can have a golden necklace, so these are the different modes, but gold remains as gold. So what Aristotle's views were, matter is a substance, substance is eternal, self-existing substance of all change, world is made up of matter and its effects. No consciousness right now, world is just made up, made up of matter and its effects. So, for example, Aristotle is one as a substance, but many as baby, teenager. Matter is the prime cause of all effects and change. So, all the changes we, we are observing is just because of matter. And the task of philosophy is to acquire the knowledge of this prime substance. I need to know what is this matter. Now, the point here is what Aristotle believed was that he saw that out of a dead body, magnets were actually emerging. So some, some jiva, dead body boy. If there's a carcass here, you'll actually see life actually erupting out of it. So he actually had a very strong belief that life just comes out of itself. So you, you have some kind of dead body or, or some kind of medium and life will just emerge out, out of something. And as it says here, the theory that life could literally spring from nothing, the last sentence of this idea, the theory that life could literally spring from nothing managed to persist for hundreds of years after Aristotle and was even being proposed by scientists as early as 1700s that life can just spring out out of nothing and how was it proved wrong? it was only with the adoption of scientific methods 
that the classical theory, the spontaneous generation began to be tested, the spontaneous evolution of life. For example, the famous scientist Louis Pasteur, we have pasteurized milk, so it's the same person, Louis Pasteur. He showed that maggots would not appear in a meat kept in a sealed container. If you actually, if, if life just came out of meat, there was a death there, then it should come out everywhere. But if you actually put meat in a, in a, in a vacuum, life will not emerge out of it. And then again with the invention of the telescope, then they found out that life just does not come out spontaneously. There has to be some kind of reason, medium behind it. So what did Aristotle had four kinds of causes? He said there's a material cause. Why am I being born? Material cause is clay is a material cause of the pot. How can I make pot clay? But just by having a piece of clay here, a pot does not come up. Then there's to be an efficient cause. An efficient cause is the water. If, if I give you a, 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 a lump of clay, you will not know what to do with it. But if you're a potter, you have got the skills, you will now be able to create a pot out of it. So there's an efficient cause. Then there's a formal cause. Then there has to be an idea in his mind. If you give it to a potter, he'll now have an idea. I'm going to pot. I'm going to make a big pot or a small pot. What kind of pot I'm going to do? So there's an idea in his mind here. So there's a formal cause. And then there's a final cause, which is the ultimate objective of what was I had a piece of clay, you had a potter, he had an idea in his mind, he has now come up with a, a final output. So Aristotle had a duality, he viewed life as matter and form. That's in his mind, that's what he was convinced. And this is very similar to the James of Jeevan Ajeev. Let's look at the example which, which he gave. Matter, C is matter, out of which comes tree, which is form. Tree then again becomes matter, interconnected, out of which you get wood. So wood now becomes form. But then wood now again becomes matter and you get a table, form. So interdependent interchanging of matter and form, matter and form. And that's what he saw life as. This is what life is about, matter and form. Inseparable, inseparable. Just as for us, Jeev and Ajeev are inseparable entities. Right now, until, but there's a caveat. Although James believed that we at liberation can separate from this matter and we can just be in our own pure consciousness. So there's a distinction between James and Aristotle. That yes, until we reach, reach liberation, my Atma's consciousness, Jeev and Ajeev, which is matter, the body, they are inseparable, inseparable entities. Uh, yes, you see them as just one entity. You cannot see them different. I cannot see my chief. I cannot see my conscious, my soul. So, what did Aristotle believe in? Formless matter. What is formless matter? Things which are too small to be seen. Atoms. Formless matter. There is no form to it. Cannot see with the naked eye. Then you have matter and form. All this interaction between matter and form. And then matterless form. God is matter but with matterless form, some kind of abstract entity. God is matter but matterless form. It is a form. God is something. I don't know what it is, but it's matterless, it's a matterless form. We now come to another great sort of scientist, Descartes. And these are all people who are slowly jumping towards the science of the, the, the consciousness. So this is how consciousness is, is coming up into the Western philosophy, starting from Aristotle to Descartes. He accepted the dualism of mind and body, not better and form, but mind and body. And he said there are three kinds of substances, God, mind and body. The absolute substance is God, absolute, no changes. But relative substances, mind and body, and what he called as mind is the soul. In, in, in our language we call his concept of mind was the soul, and body is matter. So here he is slowly getting into what we as James believe, Jeev and Ajeev. But he did not use the term, he used the term mind and body and mind, we actually attribute the concept of soul to that and body as matter. A very famous saying which comes up in all kind of philosophical texts, what is the proof that there is a, a, a mind, that there is soul? Cogito ergo sum. A very famous uh, kind of saying which he said, I think therefore I am. What is the proof? Okay, consciousness check. Well, I am thinking, therefore I am, therefore consciousness is there. If I don't think, then basically then there is no soul in my body. I am a dead, I'm a dead entity and therefore there is no soul. So the proof of me being a soul is just simple. I think, therefore I am. There is no other proof required for him. Thus soul, soul is self-evident. 
And when you actually have two separate entities, the concept was that yes, there is this mind which is soul, and then there is matter which is body. The two different entities. How do they interact with one another? If you have got two separate things, how, how do they interact with one another? After you tires check and we have got a, a, the body of a car, you need a steering wheel to make sure that the car it, it steers the, the car. You need some kind of connection medium. Otherwise, if you just had tires and if you just had a body, then then you, you still not get a car. And therefore, he then thought that the seat of the of the mind, the soul, is a pineal gland. The pineal gland, which is in our in our brain, that is the seat of the soul. And he says that that is the one which interacts between the mind and and, and the matter. So that that is a connecting part. Horse and its rider are different, yet they interact. And that is how he, he, he deduced. You have a person riding a horse. They are two separate entities, yet they are interacting. So what are the similarities and, and, and differences? So similarities are he accepts dualism of matter and consciousness, just like James, Jeev and Ajeev. Dualism has to have a relation, and this is where the differences arise between uh, James and Descartes. Descartes is a Western philosopher whose, whose aim is intellectual quest, and that is quite true for many of the people right now. The purpose of science is intellectual quest, boundaries of mind, knowledge. How can I go beyond? What next? How can I just use my intelligence just further and further? Intellectual quest. Eastern philosophy, the aim is salvation. I don't. Sometimes I don't want to use my mind. I don't want to use my logic. I just want salvation. I just want peace of mind. The, the, the aim of Descartes' dualism is to expo, explain creation. How are certain things created? How can I explain that? James' aim, uh, aim is to transcend this dualism. I want to get away out of this dualism. I just want to become my pure own soul. Descartes says that matter is a property of extension. James says that the gene, like time, etc. See, there are a gene like time with no extension. Oh yes, so so what Jane say is that uh, matter has extension, but Jane say that not all matter has extension. There is something which is time which does not have extension. So you cannot say matter is that's it. That's no other substance be, be, besides matter, because Jane said there is actually another matter which is time and which does not have extension. Uh, Descartes says pineal gland is a seat of the soul. What does Jane say? Where is the soul? Jane said that the soul is coextensive with the body. If I become an ant. The soul is going to, my soul is going to be every single pore of my body is an ant. If I become an elephant, my soul is going to be in the entire body as an, as an elephant. So the, the soul has got the propensity to expand and contract the body which it, uh, it, it gets. So now we have come up with some of those philosophies and now we look, look at space and time. Now James, as you say, have really had a lot of articles on Akas, Astikaya and Karl. So here if we had Newton, who then considered time and space as absolute and independent. Very, very similar to the James. Space and time are two separate entities, absolute and independent. Their existence depends neither on the knower nor on the things they house or relate. Whether I'm here or not, space is going to be there, time is going to be there. Space is continuous and simple, cannot be bifurcated into parts. Origination and destruction of things do not go to its quantity or its quality. A earthquake theory does not mean space has now vanished. Space is always going to be there, even if there is origination or destruction. Space cannot be uh, destroyed. Now, one thing I I didn't point out in this concept of akastikai. What is the property of dharmastikai or dharmastikai? What Jain say is that it's one entity which cannot be divided into parts. That's what Jain said. Let's just imagine that. Say there are uh, 20 people in this room here. If if I brought a piece of cake here, and if I wanted to divide it into 20 uh, people, what I have to do is 20 slices. If I make it into 20 slices, so this piece of cake has now been divided into 20 slices, and each one of you gets a slice. Now let's say, for example, I've got 20 pound note. Can I now dissect this 20 pound note into? And you say the 20 pound note is five centimeters by by four centimeters. So the area is 20 square centimeters. If I now cut it into one square centimeters, each one centimeter, if I give it to each one of you, will you have one pound? You will not have. So this 20 pound note is a single entity. You cannot, the division of 20 pounds by 20 pounds can be a conceptual entity. Yes, 20 pounds is, if I have one pound coin, if I have 20 pounds, 
the 20 pound note, but that 20 pound note is a single entity, you cannot divide it. So, the Mastikai, the Mastikai, they're not into parts, they're not like matter. They, oh yes, if I have this table, if I, if I can break it into smaller pieces, I'll have atoms, I'll have molecules. No. The Mastikai is one entity and one single entity across the entire uh, uh, space, across time. So, so, so it's a simple entity, it's not complex, it's a very simple entity. And there you go with, uh, with Newton, space is continuous and simple. It cannot be bifurcated into parts. Very similar to what James believed in, 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 in Akash and even Dharmastikaya and Dharmastikaya. You cannot bifurcate into parts. You cannot cut it. I cannot say, ah, Dharmastikaya chain, I Dharmastikaya nothing. You cannot bifurcate it, you cannot put it into parts. So Newtonian physics tried to explain motion by relating physical ether with space. Now, a very big concept came. What Newton said is, there is sunlight. Light is coming from sunlight to us here. How is light coming through? It's very distant bodies. So if scientists were perplexed, when there are vast spaces or voids, emptiness between us and the planets and the stars, huge emptiness, how does light actually come across? What's making the light come, come to us? It cannot pass through vacuum. There has to be something there. How do the rays of light travel? And then they came up with, a, with an idea of ether. There has to be some medium. Some, like as we said, if the fish wants to move, it needs a medium of water. So then the scientists came is they came up with the concept of ether. But there has to be some substance, I cannot see it, because of this substance makes the light rays tra travel. Then they said that this ether has to have some mass, it has got some, some, some weight. But then they said, ah, if there is if something has got mass, if it's, suppose there's a small particle of matter here, and if light rays come here, then would it, would it, wouldn't this particle of ether obstruct this particle here? Then they were a bit surprised that yes, if it's if it's a mass, no matter how small it is, even if it's as small as an, as an electron, but if you've got something and a light, light ray comes here, you've got obstruction. That means light will should not be. If there are so many of such kind of particles, then light cannot actually uh, travel through. Then the scientists then said, you know what? Let's create some exception, and they said, let's say that ethereal mass will not hinder the movement of light rays. No explanation given. The concept of ether was so convincing that yes, this is what makes the light travel, but they could not explain it in its entirety. If it's a, if it's a good mass, then, then it has to obstruct light. But why, why, why doesn't it obstruct light? Then it says, well, you know what, forget about it. There is no, it does not fit with reason, but we'll just make a theory that the ethereal mass will not obstruct the movement of light. Then this, this concept got so much momentum that people started think, oh, I've got a human body. There is actually uh, electrical currents. If, if I touch something here, I, 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 I get a sort of electrical impulse. What makes something uh, 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 impulse go from my hand to my brain? Well, there must be ether within my body. What causes that movement to How come fluids move from my body, from, from my heart to my legs and everything? What makes movement within, within my body? There must be something like ether within the human body. So ether has got different parts of ether. There's ether which causes the movement of light. There must be ether within my body which, which is causing movement. Now, the concept of ether in one way is very similar to the Jain concept of the Dharmastikaya and Adharmastikaya. And now here I am discussing pure science with you. I'm not talking about the merits of science. And so we are looking at pure concepts of science and religion and trying to compare that this concept of ether which was in science has got a very similarity between Dharmastikaya and Adharmastikaya. It's indivisible according to even the science. Uh, we, 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 well, we believe that Dharmastikaya is indivisible, it's achieved. It's, 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 it, it does not have consciousness and it's not material, it's not matter. According to the scientist, ether is multiple. I've, I've got ether responsible for the movement of light, I've got ether responsible for the movement of fluids. Ether is material, it's not Buddha. So they will believe ether was actually, you know, atoms of matter and it has got mass. And according to James, it's non-material, therefore it does not have any mass. So the conclusion from, from our, at least from my perspective, is physics is incomplete and changing. Whereas, if I now read the Acharan Sutra and if I read the Jain scriptures, I have now got a very convincing uh, logical explanation of what's in the universe, and, and, and it sort of satisfies your, your, your curiosity of what's there. Now, you actually had someone like Einstein who came along and he says that you know what, Newton was talking about three dimensions, Newton is only talking about space. Here is Einstein who says that life is not only three dimensions, there is actually four dimensions, there is space and time. And just rather than to go through this in a little bit more detail, 
this slightly give an example of what he meant by suppose you are in, in a state of happiness. Doesn't time seem to be going on for so long? Oh, I wish you know that holiday. It, it, it seemed like it could be a one week holiday, but it seems like a month. On the contrary, if you were in pain, even a sort of a 10 centimeters of pain, doesn't time seem to be prolonging so much more further? So the concept of speed and time is related to the observer. Let's say you actually had a, a you are sitting in a plane, so you are going in this direction at 500 miles per hour, and someone is coming on a plane on the other direction at 500 miles, miles per hour. If someone asks what is the speed, the speed is actually 1000 miles per hour because you get 500 miles per hour, the other person is moving at 500 miles per hour in the other direction, the, the speed at which you feel that people are moving away from each other is 1000 miles per hour. On the other hand, if you are moving at 500 miles per hour in this plane and this, you're, someone else is sitting on this plane at 500 miles per hour, what is the speed between both of you? Zero. You'll say that both of us, there's actually there's no speed. So according to Einstein, it's relative. I cannot come and make an absolute statement saying, ah, the speed of this object is uh, 50 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour. It's relative, relative to where I am, the, the object, the observer. So you cannot make an absolute statement that this is the speed. Speed relative to what? So he, uh, Newton, uh, Einstein rejected the Newton's concept of absoluteness of space, space and time and made them relative. Which actually diverges from the chain point of view. Okay. Um, I, Einstein, again, as everyone knows, is a very, is a very eminent scientist, and his theory of relativity has got a lot of applications in satellite technology because it's all to do with relative movement. So, some of these concepts and principles are, are, are very, very important and have got huge implications even in, in today's day and age. So this theory of relativity, so Einstein and Jainism, we sort of blend so well with this concept of relativity. Jain concept of Anekantwad, Syadwad. Uh, I mean, again, this is a separate topic in itself. Many Jain literature texts have translated Syadwad as perhaps. Because Jains perhaps say, perhaps this is a table, perhaps this is this. And there's been a lot of criticism from the Acharya saying that these Western philosophers have actually misinterpreted the the Syadwad. What Jain said is that there is, a, there is a theory of relativity. From a, at this stage in time, at this stage, this is actually a podium. I can actually disintegrate this and actually make it into a table. So, from a particular point of view, not perhaps, perhaps is an element of doubt. There is no doubt here. So, the, the element of doubt, Jains are, are not doubtful. Jain said that from a particular, this, at this stage in time, this is a table in, in, the, in, in this time period right now. If you, if, you, if you then, maybe someone else is going to break this into pieces and make, it, uh, make something else, uh, a stool, it's going to be something different. So Jains have got this concept of, of, of relativity in Anekantwa. Uh, so the relativity concept and, and Einstein are, are, are sort of very, very much sort of uh, in, in sync. Now let's look at the concept of soul. So we've seen that many of these Western philosophers have been thinking about soul. So you started off people with uh, who thought about the physical elements, then you had Plato and Aristotle, who thought about the soul, there's something matter, there's something more than this. And someone like Plato said that there are three types of soul. Appetitive, something they just want to eat, sort of plants. Spirited or sensitive, which is animals and humans, are, are, are the rational soul. So he had three categories of soul. Descartes said soul is rational, thinking. According to Descartes, a thinking mind, thought is the only hallmark of, of soul, consciousness. And only humans have it. Animals don't cannot think, so animals have got no soul. That's what Descartes believed. So quality of soul is thought and thinking has many forms. Soul is not represented in physical acts. I eat, I drink, I sleep. So according to Descartes, I eat, I drink, I sleep. There's no thinking involved there. So therefore, there is no element of soul. That's not a proof of soul. Ah, I think, I doubt, I will. This is my choice. Those processes are actually uh, constitutes the, the soul. So it's it's the thought, only thought that the power of the, if I observe thought, then thought is the hallmark of, 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 of the of soul, nothing else. Um, again, some differences between uh, Descartes and, 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 and James. I mean, according to James, what would James believe in soul? 
If you look at this, James believes that soul has got infinite qualities, out of which the four more prominent ones are mind, bliss, anand, happiness, intuition, knowledge, and energy. That that's sort of generally comes out as the prominent characteristics of soul. Descartes says only humans have soul. Jains have said Sad Jivan Kaya. Jains have said there are six forms of living beings which have got soul. The four elements, plants, and mobile beings. Mobile beings are not Mobile beings are humans, mobile beings are uh, animals, mobile beings are angels, they are devios because they are mobile and hellish beings. So all this comes under mobile. So Jains believe there are six classifications of soul. The four elements, earth, water, air, fire, plants, and, and, and mobile things. So that encompasses all forms of life. Um, again, just trying to, I mean, I've sort of spent a lot of time showing the parallels between sort of science and Jainism. Physics knows nature through the study of matter, energy, and interactions. I think I'm just going to conclude. In, in a way, they have no belief in God, or they, they struggle with the belief of God. Physics is based on laws, Newton's law of gravity, Kepler's laws, quantum theory, whereas religion is based on faith to a certain extent, philosophical deductions and revelations, what has been used. Jain use of the term Google means fusion and fusions. Uh, you know, Mahavir's Hanekantwa theory of relativity and Einstein. Jainism is a sharp distinction between the known and the knower. Atma true and what I know, subject and object. Atma is me and there's object of knowledge and the subject of knowledge. Soul according to James has got no shape, size, weight and can never be within the realm of physics. There can be no experiments, there can be no any deductions, scientific deductions which can then say that I have now detected soul. Because soul has got no mass, has got no form, has got no color, has got no taste, has got no, nothing, none of the properties of matter. It's the exact opposite of matter. Whatever are the properties of matter? Matter, according to Jane Kutkal, is a very extensive. There are whole volumes of books, and, but there are four prim primary attributes of matter, Kutkal. Touch, taste, color, and smell. Even you can have a small molecule of atom, and you can say that it has got some kind of touch, taste, you cannot see it. It's, you have to then use a common sense. That, for example, you wanted to paint your house red. It's a white piece of uh, wall here. If you now went and got a deluxe uh, pot of can, and just did, took, just took a small drop just, and, and painted on the wall. Will you say it's red? No. The intense, as soon as you do one coat, two coats, three coats, then you'll start seeing red color. So the intensity increases. So if it's a very minute, if, even if you cannot see it, like molecules and atoms, they still have touch, taste, color, and smell. Even in, in it must be in a very minute intensity. That's why you cannot see them. Um. This is kind of a, again a kind of a philosophical point which I wanted to uh, portray across. You, the James have got a very strong dictum. Paras pa graho paro jivanam. All life is interdependent and independent. It's, it's a very Tattvata Sutra, even when they met the queen and everything that becomes kind of the very succinct uh, aphorism which is, which is being portrayed to the West. Very, so all life is independent and interdependent. I'm a soul, I'm independent, but yet I cannot exist by myself. There has to be some interaction between other, other entities. Same thing with science. If you look at two huge bodies, there is actually a formula. It says G, some kind of constant, mass 1 and mass 2, and they're related by the square of the distance apart. So even if you have two separate entities, from a scientific, scientific point of view, there is some interaction between them. So even on a conscious point of view, there is some interaction between us as, as a soul, a G. So that, that dictum of Paraspa Graho Jivanam in a way sort of fits in with this kind of the scientific that there's interaction. Uh, I mean the whole domain of science is Putgal and James have actually got voluminous texts describing what is Putgal about. Obviously, James, you wouldn't find the periodic table in, in James text saying this is the elements, this is the atomic mass, and this is the chemical mass. The concept of matter has been has been described. What are the different kinds of matter? They have said that, for example, matter has got eight types of touch: hot and cold, heavy and light, uh, um, viscous and and, 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 and and wet, and there's another pair, uh, fourth pair. And what is very interesting that I just like to say in a nutshell is, for example, when we say Jane said that karma is matter, particles of matter. 
So why can't we see matter? Very, very unique and, 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 and interesting expansion which James have given. When you have matter, matter can have two properties. So whilst we have touch, there could be eight types of touch. So four pairs. So hot and cold, heavy and light. So like that, there are four pairs. There are some particles of matter which do not have the property of uh, heavy and light. They, they do not have any property of heavy and light, which means they are particles of matter but having no mass. And if so, therefore, karma, chatusparsi, and astasparsi. So those are the technical terms which the Jain scripture says: eight forms of touch and only form, uh, four forms of touch. So those particles of matter which are chatusparsi, they do not have uh, uh, heaviness and lightness. So if there is no heaviness and lightness, then those particles of matter don't have mass. And if they don't have mass, they cannot be detected by any scientific means. So science cannot say, I have now detected karma. I can now see that there is karma. So they cannot say, and there is a logical explanation because they do not have this concept of, they don't call it mass, heaviness and lightness. So they don't have that mass. Uh, and therefore, you can actually have a karmic particle here at the next instant, it could be at the top of, let's say, 5 billion miles away. Because as we know in science, the maximum speed is the speed of light. And that's what dictates how much things can move. But if something has got no mass, nothing is stopping it from being a year and being a million miles away at the next instant in time. It's got no mass. It can move, move from here to there. Nothing is impeding it. <coughs> Jainism have dis discussed what science calls positive and negative. They have called this uh, softness and roughness. So the terms which they have used, soft and rough, is, is akin to the positive charge of an electron and negative charge of an electron. So now there are people who are now spending time and saying that, you know, what has been said by science and what has been said in religion can be intertwined. So it's an interpretation what people are now making that because in the scriptures you just hear that matter has got softness and roughness, but that's been interpreted as, as, as positivity and negativity. Quantum physics is again something which is the advancing stage of what science is going along. In a nutshell, the, the essence of quantum physics is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That is the, the hallmark of the quantum physics. What it means, at any, at any stage in time, I cannot know the real state of matter. It's, it's uncertain. And, and the essence of that is, if you did an experiment, these are particles of light. If you created two holes, you will actually see that if you consider light as, as particles of matter, then you can say, ah, there are two holes here. I can see some particles coming here and some particles of light coming there. So that proves it that light is a form of particle. Then there is someone else who says that ah, let's again have a source of light and again two slits here, but now I'm actually seeing a different kind of pattern here. And I'm seeing patterns of darkness and lightness. And what does that mean? That light is not actually a particle, it's actually a wave. And where they interact, where, where this light, the, 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 the wave nature of light interacts, that's where you find. So wherever they're interacting on, on, on those two waves are interacting here, those points are dark and everywhere else is light. So this now proves that light is wave. So now you actually have two conflicting opposites because what it is the laws for this is exactly the opposite of this. Here you will have Newtonian mechanics, mass, velocity. Here you've got amplitude, you've got frequency. Separate physical concepts, totally different and yet both of them are totally opposite. But yet light at, at the same time is particle and at the same time is, is, is wave. Dual nature of light contracting principles coexisting at the same time and that's the realm of quantum physics at this instant in time can I say that light is particle or wave I can't say it, it is particle it is wave and, and two opposite uh, concepts yet at the, at the, at the, at the, existing at the same time um, this was an interesting article uh, whereby it says a scientific paper says this approach, there are some scientists says, how many species are there on the earth? And if you read this uh, academic paper, this approach was validated against well-known, uh, I can't read that. Some, some, something, it says, it predicts that 8.7 million Euro aquatic species globally of H2.2. So they are now saying that all forms of life is to the region of 8.7 million. And after a scripture say, Joras like Jiro and Imai, there are 8.4 million different species of, of, of life. And there is an independent research article with, with references which says that how many forms of life there are. Again, as I mentioned last time, a paper on the general doctrine of karma and the science of genetics, a PhD thesis on someone saying that how the Jain concept of karma and genetics are, 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 are again, again a PhD thesis. 
So people now are saying that how can we go along and use scientific knowledge, use scripture knowledge, and there's a lot of interaction between, between them. Look at this. Lot of, in the past, a lot of people have been talking about uh, Muladhar. You can go to the Rishis and the Gurus. They talk about when you meditate, meditate on this chakra, Swadista, Manipur, Anaha, Vishur, Agna, Sahasra. And here you have people saying this exactly corresponds to the, the endocrine glands of the human body. The, the chakras which you're talking about are none other than, than these different uh, endocrine glands of the human body. So science and religion are blending with one another. And when, when people talk about centers of consciousness, it's quite simple. Consciousness is all around, in, all within my body, but then it's concentrated in certain parts. So for example, if I got a gunshot wound, someone actually shot me. If I got a gunshot wound here, this is not going to be lethal. But if, some, if I got a gunshot wound around my throat or around my, my head, then that's going to be lethal. That proves it that consciousness is actually more condensed or more in, in these areas here. Because if someone did these other areas here, then or my heart. That these are the areas where if, 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 some, if there was some damage, my consciousness would go away, I would die. So, so, so that sentence of consciousness where people say, focus on this, focus on this part of your... Uh, so all the kind of the scripture, the gurus and talk of meditation. There you are having people then sort of blending with another and saying that, you know, the scientific concepts and the, and, 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 and the spiritual concepts, you know, they're blending with one another. I mean, lastly, Richard Smith, former editor of the British Medical Journal. Most scientific studies are wrong, and they're wrong because scientists are interested in funding and careers rather than the truth. Because I think money through funding, Marcel, I need to get some more funding. So, 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 so therefore, uh, uh, and then, then sort of the point at which I would like to conclude this topic here is that, at least for myself, I have a blind faith in the scriptures because scriptures does not have any of these biases here. Bhagwan Mahavir, when he did, would not have said, ah, my, I, it's for my praise or for my ego that I want to postulate certain theories. Vitragi, no, no attachment, no hatred. Vitragi, when, when they propound such truths here, they are without bias, and therefore if one has a full faith in the scriptures. It's a question of, if it doesn't make logical sense, it's my inadequacy that my mind cannot uh, grasp those concepts, but I cannot start denying those facts here, is, 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 is basically uh, the, the point. And finally, yep, last one here. Holy Scriptures, come on all ye who are tired, thirsty and hungry in your journey of life. You are lovers of truth, but only ignorant of it. Come to us, we shall enlighten you on the deep problems of life. What is life? What is this world? What is soul? What is matter? We shall quench your thirst and satisfy hunger. Come to the Scriptures. If you went to the Mathematica of Newton, those principles will keep on changing, but the Scriptures will quench your thirst. Jai Jai